Hallelujah. Let Lord Jesus Christ shine forward. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are joining us. Welcome to another live stream with DCCI Ministries. It is very late in England. It's almost like past my beauty time sleep. <laughs> but it doesn't look like Anthony Rogers needs beauty time sleep because it's like late afternoon or early evening. In US, early evening. I'm still in US. It's early evening. Wherever Anton is over there, early evening too. Correct? Yep. It is 6 p.m. I'm on the East Coast. Peace of Christ be with you, brother. How are you doing? And also with you, I'm doing great. What have you been doing since I saw you last week? Oh, far too many things. Juggling, juggling, far too many things. All good things. I like to juggle. But I, I've been preparing several things for my own channel, particularly on Psalm 22 as a messianic prophecy. So far, I've gone through a couple episodes just looking at how Christians have understood it in history. I think there's a lot of usefulness to that sort of thing. Sometimes it can inform us. We can see things that we don't see because in our context, they're not relevant. So we can often learn from people for that reason from the past, but then also it can challenge contemporary things that we hold. Maybe they've got a better insight. Uh, but yeah, I've been doing that sort of thing, preparing to get to the chapter itself and actually exegete what the text says in, in the Bible. And that for apologetic reasons, of course, but also because it has a lot of information of theological value, of practical value for Christians. So that I've also been doing some stuff with David. One thing I did recently is actually somewhat relevant to what we're going to talk about today. I appeared with David to address the claim that Islam's doctrine of God is clear. Because as you know, Daniel Hakikachu and Jake, the Muslim metaphysician, both had an interchange with Rashid and Robert Spencer. And there were a lot of things that took place in that. And one of the things that took place was the, the claim that Islam's view of God is clear. So I did a show with David talking about that. And I've also been reading this book because this is written by a Shia Muslim. And providentially... Is that the one? Very expensive one. They yeah, this is, yeah. Well, this is the one I bought at that Shia bookstore with you. And the lady tried to quadruple the price because I don't follow her false prophet. But I, I providentially got that. I didn't buy it for the reason I'm now getting into it. What happened is since I did the show with David talking about Islam's doctrine of God, in particular, the Salafi view, which I think is most consistent with at least Sunni sources. Uh, having done that with David, Khalil Andani, who actually debated Jake at one point, he saw it. He's a Shia Muslim and Ismaili, um, I believe. It's, it's my nights, yeah. Yeah. So he, he expressed an interest in having a conversation with me. And then Cameron Bertuzzi reached out to me interested in hosting it. So there's a good possibility we're going to have some sort of dialogue. I don't yet know the exact title or topic, but it's it's in this area of Tawheed and, and what did the sources teach and that sort of thing. Probably get ready, prepare to defend the Islamic sources. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know as an Ismaili, he doesn't hold to all the same sources as you know, those who would advocate Bukhari and Muslim and so forth. But I have heard some of his stuff and I know that, well, first of all, in my view, this is what the Quran says. So the errors of Salafism are only enhanced by the Hadith. I don't think they're limited to the Hadith. Allah having eyes or anatomical features is a thing that's found in the Quran, not just the Hadith. And besides that, though, there are Hadith that are even accepted by Shia Muslims that overlap on this. Of course, he'll try and give them the metaphorical spin or interpretation, and that's that's the rub, really. Well, it's a great opportunity to compare um, Allah versus our triune God. At the yeah. end, doesn't matter what sect of Islam they are following, that sect is taking them to hell. Only 
through trial that they have that salvation. Um, so tonight, um, I, 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 um, I knew that um, Quran is well detailed, well explained, clear book. Um, and you were in, was it in, Calif in California? You suddenly brought into our attention those magical Arabic words and no one know what it means. And even when it says this is well detailed, well explained, clear book, um, you pointed out, out actually that wasn't the case. Um, so I just thought I'll have you and then you tell us what is the problem with the uh, mother of the books? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you you want me to give it away right now or you want me to to lay out the problem? Lay out <laughs> the easiest so. Uh, we, are, we, we are not Einstein, so you need to break down for us so we understand that we can use with our Muslim friends. Yeah, so as you know, and, and really anybody engaging the Dawagandis, they think their book is clear. And, and that's the kind of thing you'd expect to be true of the Quran if it is inimitable, right? So... Muslims claim that the Quran is inimitable. It is so great, it soars above the literary production of any creature. No angel, no jinn, not all of them together, not the best of mankind. No one could produce a book like this. And if that's the claim, and that's its chief claim, right? When Muhammad tried to argue for the truth of the Quran, it wasn't, here's this miracle attesting to its truthfulness that it comes from Allah. The claim was that it's inimitable, right? You can't produce a surah like it. So involved in that would have to be this idea of its clarity. If it's not clear, then how's it going to stand forth to us as this grand book that surpasses everything else? If it's not clear, well, I can point you to clear books, whether they're right or wrong, and so the Quran would fall short of those books. So one of the things that would have to be true of it is it's, it would have to be clear. It also claims to be guidance, right? A, in fact, just the idea of revelation, to reveal something means to disclose it. A revelation is an unveiling. So something that is unclear or unknown is in revelation being disclosed. It's being made known. And so if the Quran claims to be revelation, if it claims to be guidance, if it claims to be inimitable, then involved in that would have to be the idea that the Quran is clear. And the fact is that the Quran claims to be clear, doesn't it? It, it claims to be clear throughout. And so I don't know if you want to put my slides on the screen, but or I could just read these. But yeah, so uh, before I give you some of these passages. This is a quotation from Ali Dashti. He's a Iranian journalist from last century. I don't even know if he's still alive, but he wrote a book, very, very dangerous thing to do in his day, right? He's, he was Iranian and he's criticizing Islam, the Quran, Muhammad, the mullahs, the imams and so forth and in his book 23 years subtitled a study of the prophetic career of muhammad he said muhammad saw the quran as the warrant for his prophethood so that's the point i was just making it's inimitable muslim scholars are unanimous in regarding the quran as muhammad's miracle now don't get thrown off there folks by the transliteration there's no standard way that you have to transliterate arabic words and even though there's no standard way, there are some that we're more used to, I think, but this one's pretty bizarre, I think. Quran is spelt oddly, but anyways, it's, it's just the choice of the translator here. There's been much debate, however, on the question whether the Quran is miraculous in respect of its eloquence or of its subject matter or of both. So is the Quran eloquent in the, or inimitable superlatively great in terms of its content because it sets forth the exact truth about Allah and things related to him? Or is it inimitable because of the way it presents these things, the language, the style, and so forth? Well, as he goes on to say, in general, the Muslim scholars consider it to be miraculous in both respects. This opinion clearly stems from zealous faith rather than impartial study. So notice 
the little jab there at the end, it tells you where Ali Dashti is coming from. He says that this is more a matter of faith than it is something that's empirically or objectively verifiable. Right. So he, he goes on to say, non-Muslim scholars have found numerous grounds for questioning the intelligibility and eloquence of the Quran, and Muslim scholars have concurred insofar as they have found that the Quran needs interpretation. Now, here what he's saying is not that Muslim scholars agree that the Quran is unintelligible and it's just gobbledygook. He's saying by virtue of the fact that they admit that it, it, they're enmeshed in all sorts of strenuous effort to try and make this book intelligible, they are thereby tacitly or unwittingly evidencing that the Quran is not really a clear book. If it were a clear book, they wouldn't have to do all of these fantastic things, right? They wouldn't have to engage in uh, very uh, strange maneuvers to make it say what they want it to say. So this is Ali Dashti, a Iranian uh, individual, had a Muslim background. But what about the claim? Okay, so before challenging the claim, I just want to show that the Quran does make this claim. The Quran does claim to be a clear book. Now, this is the sort of thing that a lot of Christians have pointed out. What I'm saying here is not new in the, on the apologetic scene. What I'm going to show you later, maybe not in this episode, but eventually when I get to the whole issue of the mother of all problems, you'll, you'll see that this is a much bigger problem than I think some Christians have realized. But at least this much is recognized often by Christians. The Quran claims to be a clear book. And one of the uses we can make of that is when Muslims start engaging in all sorts of dance moves, trying to get around things, we can constantly remind them, your book claims to be clear, right? Quit acting like it doesn't mean exactly what it says. When the Quran says off with their heads, that's what it means. You don't have to, you know, engage in, in a bunch of hocus pocus or verbal ledger domain, uh, trying to make it say something it doesn't clearly say. It claims to be a clear book. And if you have to do all of these things to try and make it say something different, then you're refuting it even while trying to defend it. Right. So that's one use that we can make of the claim that the Quran is a clear book. But there's also the fact that if the Quran is clear and then it turns out not to be clear, well, that's a devastating refutation. It's an internal contradiction in the Quran. Right. Remember what Muhammad says at one point in the Quran? He says, if there if this was not from Allah, then you'd find in it much contradictions. Well, if the Quran claims to be clear and it turns out that it's not clear, well, that's a contradiction. So there's a second use that Christians can make of this claim. So, But let's look at this claim just to see that it's what the Quran itself uh, claims. Okay. So, um, yes. Can I jump in? Yeah. So um, I don't think it would be, I think it would be surprising if the expectations of Muslims and even non-Muslims that, um, Quran is like that so you kind of think about it Allah from eternity beginning to time of Muhammad have this this book in his hand in his heavenly tablets so he had like more than enough time to make it in the language 7th century people could understand as well as 21st century people could understand at the end Allah supposed to be perfect and self-sufficient all that junk so he had more than enough time to make his book clear. He had more than enough time to give us the essential details. So I, I think we are not asking like, have you cut your nail? But we would expect um, if it is well detailed that Allah gives us more than 40 Arabic words on the death of Jesus, what, what happened to him. So it shouldn't, like I wouldn't be, I'm not surprised that humanity is expecting last revelation of Allah to be clear, well detailed, well explained. Is that like bad assumption? No, 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 no. Uh, I just, obviously as an eternal being, there shouldn't be any time between the production of the Quran and its delivery to Muhammad. But given the fact, right? Uh, there, there are also issues here, but 
But uh, given the, the claims and so forth, for a Muslim to believe the Quran is eternal, and yet in its transmission to Muhammad, it doesn't come through clearly, it's garbled. Well, that's that's a problem, right? That there, there shouldn't be those flaws in it. They, they should have been, they, they should have never been there to begin with. And if they ever entered into it, then that should have, uh, it shouldn't have been something that had to go through a process. Well, in fact, we know that it did go through a process, didn't it? Even even as Muhammad was promulgating it, he had to retract things. He had to add things to clarify. There, are, uh, when you think of the issue of abrogation, it's kind of interesting because and it's confusing as well because it's not only the case that verses that are abrogated become expunged from the Quran; they're erased from the Quran. There are even instances where there are verses that remain in the Quran that were abrogated, and sometimes the abrogating verse is very far away from the verse that's abrogated. So you also have to know the order uh, in which these things were revealed to know what's later, and that's not stated in the Quran. But in some cases, the abrogating verse comes right after the verse that's abrogated. And so you've got this verse from a, a later time period being added to a verse from an earlier time period. Why didn't Allah get this all straight before he gave Muhammad the book, right? And why, we've talked about this before, it always amazes me how Allah doesn't seem to correct these mistakes until the Jews first correct Muhammad, right? There are a number of examples where Allah gives a new revelation correcting something, but it's not until Muhammad finds out that there's a problem, and he doesn't find out there's a problem until the Jews point it out. Right, so a classic example would be the the issue of. Huh? That's why we need one another. One, one, we need one another to remind us. Yeah. And then remind Allah, so it's that like good. Yeah. So the example I was thinking of is how Allah in the Quran swears by created things. Right. He swears by the sun. He swears by the moon. He swears by the pen. Which, by the way, he created. It's the first thing he supposedly created. And this pen is what was responsible for writing things. You'd think that between himself and the pen, they could have worked out any of these unclear things. But uh, anyway, so he, he swears by these things. And there's a long list of things that Allah swears by. He swears by the book. He swears by the star. He swears by Muhammad's soul. Right. And. Yet the Jews come along to Muhammad on one occasion and they tell him he's guilty of shirk because he's uh, his followers are swearing by created things. And then suddenly after that, not all suddenly, but, you know, after that, Allah sends down a revelation correcting this. And, and then Muhammad forbids his followers from swearing by created things because it's shirk. So point point is, why was Allah giving forth a revelation that needed to be corrected later. And, and this is just one of many astounding examples, but uh, yeah, he's got a lot of time on his hands, right? So yeah. what so, gives? You yeah. think he get it clear, not just get it right. Um, such a strange thing, but yeah, like as I don't think like we should expect less, like we should expect, word of Allah to be clear, well detailed and well explained since this is the last revelation to humanity. That's what all he's going to say and then stop from then. And I think you are going to point to us. No, it's not that simple. No, no. Yeah. So I'm definitely going to challenge the claim. But first, I, I want people to see just how rich and full the claim is. I don't mean rich in it like a good sense. The Quran rich and the Quran shouldn't go together. The Quran is an impoverished, poor, poor book, but rich in the sense of plentiful. There are many, many, many statements in the Quran that it's a clear book. And one of the things it makes me think of is, have you ever had a person who seems to have a guilty conscience and they can't help but constantly try to defend themselves, right? So, for example, if somebody is always characterized by evil speech, they're constantly tearing people down, speaking nasty about them. Well, that person will constantly try and defend their actions, right? Whereas a person who's doing what they know is right doesn't have to constantly try and defend himself. 
Well, you see an example of this when Muhammad constantly, or Allah allegedly, goes out of his way in the Quran to constantly say Muhammad's not demon-possessed. Right? How many times does the Quran say, Muhammad is not demon-possessed? Did I tell you Muhammad's not demon-possessed? By the way, Muhammad is not demon-possessed. And in case you forgot, Muhammad's not possessed. He's not a madman. He's not uh, a sorcerer and, and so forth. It reminds one of the Shakespeare play where uh, the response is given, methinks the lady doth protest too much, meaning by by protesting so much, you're sort of, you're showing that maybe there's some truth to this and that you've got this perceived need to go out of your way and, and try and say it's not so. Well, it, it, it's almost as if Muhammad knows that the Quran is not a clear book. He knows that it's garbage. And, and so he wants to kind of drill it in. And this is a, this is a well-known propaganda technique. People that are manipulators will tell you that one of the ways they do this is they constantly repeat things, right? They'll try and, I mean, again, I mean, in this case, it's not that there's never a place for repetition or anything like that, but it, it, it's a tool that can be used to manipulate. And so when I read these statements in the Quran and I see that there are so many of them and that he was making this claim from the beginning of his pro prophetic career, quote unquote, false prophetic career, but claiming to be a prophet from the beginning until his death, almost that just a little bit before his death. Uh, there's something that, that we have to talk about, but, probably won't get to today, but for the most part, he was claiming that the Quran was clear ever since he claimed to be a prophet. So here's here's the first verse uh, that I want to use on this. It's Surah 11.1. 1. It says, Ali Flam Ra, of course, letters of the Arabic alphabet. It says, this is a book whose verses are well perfected and then fully explained. It is from one who is all wise, all aware. Now, you probably recognize the translator here. Uh, what do you know what Quran that is? I know you know this Quran because we've talked about it before, but uh, I'm using the translator's name, but he actually has a name for his Quran. Do you remember which one it is? Clear Quran. Yeah, the clear Quran. Yep. So Mustafa Katab, he famously is known for translating the Quran because he thought that other English translations were inadequate. For example, he said that one day he was riding in a cab and this cabbie found out he was a Muslim and said, you know, I could never be a Muslim because the Quran says that non-Muslims are uh, worse than animals or something like that. And so Mustafa Khattab says, oh, he says, I once I heard that, I knew that I had to translate the Quran because these other translations get it wrong. And so, you know, First of all, plenty of translations don't render it animals. It's the worst of all creatures, right? So there was no need for him to produce a new Quran just for that reason. But it's not any more helpful to translate it the worst of all creatures than the worst, worst than animals, because if you're the worst of all creatures, it means you're worse than an animal, right? Or it means animals are the worst of all creatures and you're an animal. So I mean, just it's not really helpful. The Quran... You, you can't really, it doesn't matter what you do, that trying to help the Quran out, unless you just completely throw it away and rewrite it, it's, it's always going to be, uh, you know, a, a bad book, right? Anyways, so Mustafa Kitab, this is his translation in the clear Quran. But notice the part I have underlined. It says that it's a book whose verses are well perfected. So the claim here is that the constituent elements or parts of the book are clear, right? So Surah 17.1 should be clear. Surah 17.2 should be clear. Surah 11.1 should be clear that, because it, these are verses of, the, of this book, right? So it's a book whose verses are well perfected. Now keep that in mind. Here's another trans. This is Assad's translation. You've got much the same thing, just different choice of English words, a divine writ is this with messages that have been made clear in and by themselves. They are distinctly spelled out. Here is what the study Quran says on this verse. It says, Ali Flam Ra, a book whose signs, so the word for verses is signs in Arabic, 
and it says uh, a book whose signs have been determined, which means they have a definite meaning, then expounded from the presence of one wise aware. Here's their commentary. So that was their translation. The commentary says the, that the Quran's signs are determined signifies that the Quran is clear and unambiguous in meaning. Right? So here's Surah 12, 1 through 2. So it's not just Surah 11 that says this. Surah 12 says it. Alif Lam Ra. Muhammad apparently likes those three letters. These are the verses of the clear book. Now, notice here, it, it's not just saying that the verses are clear. Now it's saying that the book is clear. So you've got a statement about the parts and about the whole. Okay? And the reason this is important is because I don't know if you've, uh, I'm sure you can spot the error when you hear it, but I don't know if you've heard the term com uh, composition fallacy, but that's that's a way of referring to a fallacy in logic when a person says that the parts of something or that the whole of something is equal to its parts in the sense that, so for example, if I say I have there's a wall outside that has 100 bricks in it and each brick weighs a pound. So if all the parts weigh a pound, then the whole must weigh a pound, right? No, that doesn't make sense. Just because each part weighs a pound doesn't mean the whole thing weighs a pound. You have to add them all up. So it, it's a mistake. If I say the whole wall weighs uh, 100 pounds, and then you say, okay, so each brick that makes up the wall weighs 100 pounds, that would be wrong too. Right? So that's a composition fallacy. What I'm showing is the Quran makes the statement in both directions. It says that its verses are clear, and the book as a whole is clear, right? So notice how comprehensive the claim is. Now we've got two examples of this in the Quran. There's another Muslim translator, Munshi, using different language, but again, I think making the same point. It says the verses are clear. Uh, these are the verses of the clear, lucid book. And notice it makes the point that I was making before. Surely we have revealed this Quran in Arabic so that you may understand, right? In order for the Quran to be guidance, in order for the Quran to be revelation, in order for it to function this way, it has to be clear. If it's not clear, then what good is it in the end? It, it ends up being a non-starter. It, it, you know, it's like somebody shooting the gun to start a race and uh, the person tripping out of the starting gate. If the Quran is not clear, it doesn't get us anywhere. It could be anything that Allah claims it is, or Muhammad claims it is, but it would be worthless to us if it's not clear. And, and the Quran is claiming to be clear so that we may understand. So here's Surah 15, Ali Flam Ra. Now this translator doesn't spell out the or alliterate the sound of the Greek, or the, excuse me, the Arabic letters. I'm used to Greek more than Arabic. Uh, but that represents Ali Flam Ra. These are the ayats, so that's the Arabic word for signs or verses. These are the ayats of revelation of a Quran that makes things clear. Now, notice this. The Quran is here being described not only as light, but as illuminating, right? It's not only clear, it is that which makes things clear. So it's like a flashlight, right? It, it, it's something that should lighten your path. The Bible makes this claim. The Bible makes good on the claim too, right? But the Quran is making a similar claim. It's claiming that it is clear in itself, and that clarity shines light on other things. So again, this is the sort of thing you'd expect. If it's going to be guidance, if it's going to be revelation, then it would have to be clear and clarifying. Another translation says it's a discourse clear in itself and clearly showing the truth. This is a Quran, a plain reading, and a revelation that explains itself. So notice now it's clarifying itself. So that's how this translator is understanding the Arabic, that it clarifies itself. So what do you need beyond the Quran? The Quran's got it all. It's clear. Its verses are clear. The book as a whole is clear. It explains itself. It explains other things. Here's Surah 24.1. Are you starting to see this is this is something that Muhammad really wanted people to believe? Right? It, I'm, I'm seeing it's a very clear book. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, you're seeing it. It, it claims to be a clear book, right? Uh, One of the things um, I learned in my early days of evangelizing Muslims is at the end of each verse, whatever claim Allah makes about himself, he just did some opposite of that in the verse. Like, for, exa very... for example, when Allah says, like, uh, don't put the girls into the prostitution, 
but if you do it, Allah is merciful and forgiving. Um, Allah says, uh, makes historical claims about death of Jesus. And then that verse finishes with Allah is all wise. So when it says Allah is all wise, you know, Allah just said something stupid and then tries to back himself up. Yeah, yeah. It reminds me of uh, what's that in your hand, oh, Moses? And, well, this I is am. a this is a <laughs> stick with it. I, I hit things and all sorts of other fun stuff, Allah. And then, and then the same verse calls Allah the wise. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, so you're seeing that this is a claim that the Quran makes. It makes it in several verses and it involves a pretty comprehensive claim to clarity it, it's not just a verse but verses it's the verses that make up the book it's the book as a whole these verses are clear in themselves they're clarifying they explain other things so this is a, a pretty persistent claim in the quran but we need to we need to really see how r repetitive the quran is on this Right. Because it's it's just like I was saying, you know, when Muhammad's constantly saying he's not demon possessed. Right. You've you've got to wonder, why does this guy think he needs to go running around saying this so often? It's one thing. Somebody makes the charge and you respond to it. It's another thing to never be able to shake this. And you've constantly got to say you're not demon possessed. Right. What kinds of things might make them think he's demon possessed? Well, flopping around on the ground like a fish, foaming at the mouth, his eyes rolling back in his head, getting up saying he heard the, the sound of bees buzzing around him, moaning like a camel, right? All those things that Muhammad did according to the Hadith when he supposedly was receiving revelation, those are some things that might lead them to think he was demonic, uh, demonically possessed. Also, the, the content of his revelations might have led them to think so. And maybe the fact that he thought he was demon possessed when he was manhandled in the cave, that might have done it. Maybe the fact that his wet nurse thought he was demon possessed even when he was a little child, right? Maybe these sorts of things lead people to think he's demon possessed. Well, Muhammad then is is dealing with this and he's even plagued by it himself because he wanted to he wanted to commit suicide, thinking he was possibly possessed. Woe is me, poet or possessed, right? So this this reveals something about the psyche of Muhammad. He he's uneasy about this issue of his potential or possible demonic possession, but he also seems to have the same uneasiness when it comes to the Quran. He thinks that he has to constantly going around, he has to constantly go around and say this book is clear, right? Because if you're tempted to think this book is not clear, let me tell you at the outset it's clear. Right before you tell me that my revelations sound like mishmash, I'm telling you it's clear in advance. Right? It's like it's like he's trying to psychologically, you know, work over his followers to think that the Quran is clear even when they know that it's not. Right? So if you've got this idea ringing in your head and you run across something and, and it looks unclear, you're going to say, "Oh, well, Muhammad said it's clear, so the problem must be with me." Right. That, that's the kind of thing that's going on here. So here's 24 one. It says this is a chapter which we have sent down and decreed its commands and in which we have sent down clear verses in order that you may ponder. So that's Hawks translation. Here's another one. It says we have revealed clear verses. Here's Surah 27, one through two. There's Ta Sin, the two other Arabic letters. These are verses from the Quran, and it is a clear book offered for guidance and is good news for believers. So again, it's clear because that's what's needed for guidance. You have Rodwell's translation rendering it as lucid book. Here's Surah 28, 1 through 2, Ta Sin Mim. These are the verses of the clear and clarifying book. So Najad uh, also reflects this idea that the Arabic entails not only that it is clear in itself, but that it clarifies. Aziz also follows suit there, the book that clarifies. Surah 41, 1 through 3, two more Arabic letters, followed by a revelation from God, should say Allah, so as not to confuse the Arabic figure dreamed up by pagans with the true God, but a revelation from Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful, a book whose revelations are well expounded, an Arabic Quran for people who possess knowledge. So here it's making the claim that it's explaining things, right? It's not just making some 
pithy comment that is otherwise ambiguous to us, the Quran explains itself. It's clear. In fact, that's how Koskis translates it, uh, a book whose verses have been made clear. Here's 41, 1 through 3. Or actually, it's this is uh, Yusuf Ali's commentary on this. Notice that he says, it is not merely a book of dark sayings, but everything is explained clearly from various points of view. Third, it's in Arabic, the language of the people among whom it was first promulgated, and therefore easily intelligible to them if they take the trouble to understand. So it's clear, right? Everything. It's not just me claiming this. It's not just me thinking, hey, this sounds like it's claiming to be clear. It's Muslims saying the same thing. I've quoted the study Quran already. Now I've quoted Yusuf Ali. For those that don't know, Yusuf Ali used to be the go-to choice for Muslims who didn't read Arabic or when they would recommend the Quran to people who don't speak Arabic. Yusuf Ali was, was the man back in the day, and his translation of the Quran came with a running commentary, which they've had to redo over the years because Christian evangelists were using it to such great effect. And uh, so they had to. Let's... Yeah, they stopped it um, with the. Um, so Yusuf Ali has footnotes, and one of the footnotes we used to use, um, make a point how Quran has been changed, uh, in Surah thirty three. Thirty three six, yeah. In in his footnote, it says like Ubaibin Kaab's Quran is different. Wow. You see the example. Since then, does not go to the Quran, go to Quran anymore. Like. Now they go with like Sahih International, Mufsin Khan, um, anything else, but not Yusuf Ali anymore. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a lot of stuff in Yusuf Ali that was helpful. Um, yeah, so, uh, but he's, you know, the point there is just that he's not a slacker, right? I, I'm not just picking some random guy that has no voice as a Muslim. He's somebody that Muslims used to uh, look to. He was a very famous translator. He wrote really good English. I was always impressed with his ability to communicate. I think he was clear. I don't think Muhammad was clear. But uh, anyways, so Surah 655, it says, thus do we make distinct the communications and so that the way of the guilty may become clear. So note, it's using the language of distinct here, but the idea is the words are not ambiguous, right? He's got definite He's using words that have definite, distinct meanings. They're they're not uh, confused. They're not uh, malleable. They 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 have very definite meanings so that you can understand. Notice so that the way of the guilty may become clear. Again, the Quran can't function as guidance as it claims if it's not a clear book. Abdul Hai says uh, we explain in detail the verses so that the way of the sinner becomes clear. Here's Surah seven one seventy two, and I'll. I've got a bunch more of these. I'll probably skip past some of them to start getting to some of the problems with this. I think people are getting the point. But here's Surah 7, 172. O Prophet, remind mankind about the incident when your Lord brought into existence. This is a funny passage all by itself, by the way. Um, re remind mankind about the incident when your Lord brought into existence. Now, by the way, notice it says remind mankind. So Muhammad's here telling a tale that people are already supposed to know, right? This ties in with other claims or other times we've encountered in Islamic sources where, you know, Muhammad's called the ear, right? Because he would hear stories and tell them and wasn't smart enough to know when the story wasn't really from the Bible or when it was from a fable or, or the Talmud or some other legend of the Jews, right? So anyways, he's, he's saying, remind mankind about the incident. You know, why you know why is Allah telling people stuff that they already know from you know time immemorial? Uh, you'd think that if he's revealing something in an eternal book, he'd start revealing something to Muhammad that people didn't already know. Anyways, he's reminding mankind about the incident when your Lord brought into existence the offspring from the loins of Adam and his descendants, virtually each single individual of mankind, and made them testify about themselves. Now. If you're reading this, this is an example. I'm jumping the gun here a little bit. Actually, maybe I shouldn't. Uh, maybe I shouldn't jump the gun. We'll come back to this. But th the idea is that Allah has brought forth Adam's descendants 
and revealed himself to everybody. So everybody knows who Allah is. And just how he does that, I'll come back to. But he goes on to say, am I not your Lord? They all replied, yes, we bear witness that you are. This we did, lest you mankind should say on the day of resurrection, we were not aware of this fact that you are our Lord and that there will be a day of judgment or lest you should say, our fathers started the practice of shirk and we just followed being their descendants. Will you then destroy us on account of, of following the sin committed by those wrongdoers? Thus do we spell out our revelation so that you might return to the right way. So Allah is saying, you knew the right way from the beginning. Uh, you can't just claim that your fathers led you astray. And uh, I'm in this Quran reminding you and, and revealing these things to you, spelling them out clearly so that you have no excuse. Right? So that's the basic claim here. Okay, so many more verses that I could quote. As you can see, they're flashing on the screen. Here's all the verses that I just read to you and the verses, or excuse me, here's all the verses in the Quran that say it's a clear book. Here are the verses that I just read to you or that I just quickly flashed on the screen there. So if you thought that that was a little repetitive, imagine if I went through all of these verses. I only scratched, I think I only went through like a third of the, the statements in the Quran claiming that it's a clear book. So this is very clearly a claim that the Quran makes, right? But now, I obviously, I don't think it's a clear book or I wouldn't be doing this, right? Uh, I, I'm obviously not a, a proponent of Islam and I wouldn't just be giving some discourse about something that would otherwise look good, right? If a book is clear, then how's that a criticism? Well, obviously I'm not stopping here. So the, the Quran makes the claim that it's a clear book, but because the Quran contains much contradiction, we're going to see not just that the Quran is not clear, but that the very verses where the Quran claims to be clear are not clear. There is in them a great deal of ambiguity, right? And again, I want to remind people, especially those that are coming in later, what I'm saying right now is very useful, but it's, it's not necessarily something new, but this is a setup for something I'm going to probably talk about on a subsequent episode with Hatun that is utterly devastating to Islam. This is devastating, to be sure, but there's something further that really is just, the, I, I think it's the, uh, the coupe de grace, right? It, it's, it's really the, the, the big gun in terms of the claim of the Quran to be a clear book. All right, so uh, let's look back at some of these verses where the Quran claims to be clear. Before doing that really quickly, I just want you to see that these verses are found in both Meccan and Medinan surahs. So this is something that Muhammad was claiming from the beginning. It's not a claim that he started making towards the end or that he stopped making. You know, Maybe somebody might want to say, well, he was clear in the first surahs, but then everything, Allah decided that everything needed to be really obscure. And so all the surahs after that are not, right? You've got this claim being made throughout Muhammad's prophetic career. And again, when I say prophetic career, I'm not granting that Muhammad was a prophet. I, I mean, of course, the, the period of time when he claimed to be a prophet. All right, so these are Meccan surahs and Medinan surahs. By the way, I have in parentheses there numbers next to these uh, chapters and ayahs, and those numbers represent the alleged chronology. So surah 75 is allegedly the 31st surah of the Quran to be revealed. So it's, it's an early Meccan surah. Uh, 38 or is actually the 38th surah allegedly revealed. Surah 7 is the 39th surah to be revealed. So here you see these are Meccan surahs and Medinan surahs, and you see something of where they fall out in the chronology. All right. Um, let's see here. All right. Here's everybody's favorite, Yasser Qadi. Yasser Qadi the ultra crepidarian himself here's yasser Qadi telling you what i've just told you because we need we need to hear it from yasser Qadi too yasser this is yasser Qadi's book on ulul al quran which refers to the sciences of the quran so things related to its interpretation 
and that sort of thing, the occasion of revelation, everything related to the disciplines involved in knowing the Quran, that's what his book is about. Now, there's many books written on this in Arabic. However, in English, there's only a handful. And as far as I know, Yasser Qadis is probably the foremost among those in English. So if anybody's interested in this topic, his book is the book to get. But what's interesting, as, as we know now, in the book, he presents the standard narrative, right, about the tr Quran's transmission, how it was perfectly preserved. He does that sort of thing in the book. But he tells us in, in his uh, attempt to climb out of the hole he dug with Muhammad Hijab, he tells us that he's always known that this is not true, but in the book he gives the standard narrative, right? So he's he, he wrote this book knowing that some of the things he was saying in it just weren't true. Well, let me show you one of the things he's got to know just isn't true. Here, here's something he claims in the book. In these verses, so he gives two verses, Surah 10.1 and 11.1, Allah is saying that the whole Quran is a clear, perfect book which acts as a criterion between good and evil. Okay, so here you have Yasser Qadi joining his voice with Yusuf Ali and the study Quran and saying that all these verses affirm the Quran's perfection and clarity. That's why it can function as a criterion, a way of ferreting out that which is true from that which is false. Okay, so the whole Quran is clear. All right, what are some problems with this? Let's look at Surah 11.1. That's the Surah we started off with. Notice, first of all, and I'm sure you guys noticed them, but perhaps you didn't even think about it at the time. But notice the first three letters, Alif, Lam, Ra. Here's the study Quran. Look at the bold part. This is the footnote in the study Quran. It says that the Quran signs are determined, signifies that the Quran is clear and unambiguous in meaning. Now notice just before this, right right before claiming that the Quran is clear, it says the Arabic letters, Alif, Lam, Ra, are among the separated letters found at the beginning of 29 surahs, whose ultimate meaning, most commentators attest, is known only to God. So now let me ask Hatun, and I know this, this is a softball question, if these verses or the meaning of at least this part of the verse is known only to Allah, is that what we mean by clear? If we say something is clear, but nobody can understand it except God, is, is that clear? Well, I think so, because it's been mentioned like in 29 surah is clear after clear, only Allah knows. Probably, yeah, we, that's clear to me. Well, yeah. So, well, it's clear to you that only Allah knows, but it's not clear to you what it means, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. So Allah knows. Yeah. So, notice. I mean, this is the a verse that's claiming that the Quran is exhaustively clear and detailed, and all the rest, or it's part of that overall claim. And at the very beginning of the surah, you have these nonsense letters that rep that tell us nothing. Okay, they are meaningless to us. They're just sounds. All right, but it gets worse. But here's what Yusuf Ali says. Certain surahs have certain initials prefixed to them, which are called the abbreviated letters. A number of conjectures have been made as to their meaning. Opinions are divided as to the exact meaning of each particular letter or combination of letters, and it's agreed that only Allah knows their exact meaning. Now, Remember how the Quran constantly tries to upbraid Jews and Christians for having differences among them, and sometimes even puts them down as having conjectural ideas, conjectural notions. Remember Surah 4, 157, which is supposed to sweep away all the historical evidence for the crucifixion of Jesus, it says that those who claim that Jesus was crucified and killed and so forth, they have nothing but conjecture, right? The Quran lays this at the feet of Jews and Christians. And it claims that it dispels the ambiguity that otherwise fogs our mind. That's Muhammad's charge against Jews and Christians. Well, here's Yusuf Ali admitting, at least with respect to these letters, 
in these verses that claim to be clear, of the book that claims to be clear, they're admitting these verses are to us unintelligible. We do not know what they mean. Only Allah knows what they mean, right? Huge problem, I think. But notice also that he says a number of conjectures. Opinions are divided. It's not just one opinion over another. Uh, in fact, let's go back to uh, Yasser Qadi for a moment. I know that people aren't going to be able to read this, but you'll, if you can count that, I can't tell how big it is on your screen. There's, I have 12 red circles. Okay? What this represents are 12 different interpretation of the meaning of the different letters that precede certain verses of the Quran. Twelve different interpretations, or really conjectures, opinions, guesses, the sort of thing the Quran accuses Jews and Christians of, but here Muslims are admitting is true of Allah's absolutely clear book. Twelve suggestions. By the way, the whole discussion of this in Yasser Qadi's book tells us that these aren't the only suggestions. These are just the most common ones that he's decided to give in his book. So Mr. Holes in the narrative is pointing out to us another hole in the Quran, not just a hole in the claim that it was transmitted perfectly, but a hole in the claim that the Quran is exhaustively clear. Right now, that's just for starters. Notice that Surah 11.1 says it is from the one who is all wise all aware. Now, I know nobody stumbled when they heard that and thought, oh, that that's a problem, right? Everybody heard that and thought, that's the sort of thing you'd expect Allah to say, right? It's This is the book of Tawheed, isn't it? Allah repudiates shirk throughout the Quran, no association of partners with him. He is alone. He has no, he has no mate, right? Uh, Surah 4211, often misused by Muslims to argue that Allah is unique. Uh, in the sense that his attributes or qualities are unlike any other thing. But all, all Surah 4211 is saying is Allah doesn't have a counterpart, right? Allah doesn't have a spouse. When Surah 4211 says there's nothing like him, the context of the verse is saying that Allah created mates for everything, right? So there's the animals have mates, the plants have mates, uh, according to Allah. Everything has a mate. Men have mates, wives, you know, women have mates. The Allah doesn't have a mate. There's nothing like him, meaning there's no female counterpart to Allah. So it's not saying Allah is not otherwise like anything. It's just saying there's not another, there's not a female uh, sidekick for Muhammad, right? Or excuse me, Allah. Well, Allah, Muhammad, same thing, right? Uh, Allah is just Muhammad's sock puppet. But here's, so here's the, the statement, Surah 11.1, 1, it is from the one who is all wise, all aware. So in this verse that begins with these gibberish letters, is followed by a claim that the verses are clear, it makes reference to the one who is all wise, all aware. Okay, notice it's from him. All right, so that was, that was the one, but notice this, here's the we, Alif, Lam, Ra, this is the very next Surah of the Quran. These are the verses of the clear book, we have revealed it in Arabic Quran so that you may understand. Well, now, wait a minute. Why does the former verse say the one and the latter verse, this verse, says the we, if you will? Right? You have Allah speaking as an absolute unity or in accord with the claim of him being an absolute monad. But here you have Allah speaking out of accord with what's fundamentally true of him. Why is he speaking about himself in the plural? Now, before our Muslim friends want to chime in here and say, this is just a plural of majesty, number one, where does the Quran say that? I, I challenge that claim. In fact, I have a 50-page article on answering Islam. It's been up for years. No Muslim has come within a thousand miles of refuting it. It's been up for years on the Answering Islam website, 50-page article, in which I discuss all the different theories, the many theories that Muslims have, precisely because the Quran does not explain this. Okay? The Quran does not explain this. Now, it's even worse, but... That's part two. Uh, I'll get to the, the even worse part in part two. But another point that I'll make here before moving on is 
it's well known to at least Arab scholars that this whole idea is a makeshift. It's a made-up response to a perceived problem. The idea that this is just a royal we is unattested in Arabic at the time of Muhammad. There's an article written some time ago by M.A.S. Abdel Halim. So he's a well-known Arabic scholar. He has his own translation of the Quran and has done many other things. But he wrote an article in an Islamic journal called Iltifat, which is trying to deal with the Quran's very confusing bantering back and forth. Sometimes it speaks in the singular, sometimes in the plural, sometimes it speaks in the first person, sometimes in the third person, sometimes in the same verse it switches. And so it's very hard, it's dizzying to try and keep track of who's talking because the author of the Quran doesn't, it's, it's almost like what's happening is there's this human being who's the real author of this book. He's pretending like there's a divine being who's the author of this book. And occasionally, while he's pretending to represent what this being is saying, he actually slips into the first person and speaks from himself. And then other times speaks about him in the third person. And then other times speaks as if it's him speaking, that is Allah. That's, that's the more likely explanation once you realize that Muhammad was a huckster and a man who thought he was demon-possessed. But in any case, M.A.S. Abdel Halim wrote an article on this curious phenomena in the Quran, and he said that there was no such thing as a plural of majesty at the time that Muhammad wrote the Quran in Arabic. It's simply a myth. It's not true. And the Quran does not explain it that way. Moreover, when you look at the rationale, this is what I do in my articles, I, I point out that even... Even trying to discern this from the usage of the Quran, because some Muslims will say, well, when Allah wants to show his closeness, he says, I. When he wants to show his distance and majesty, he says, we. Well, I show that's just not true. right? It's not true. When you look at the Quran, it's often the opposite. right? Sometimes it's this way. Sometimes it's that way. Allah can't keep this usage straight. You're not going to get royal a we out of any of this from the Quran. The Quran doesn't tell you because the author of the Quran, here's an anticipation for next time, the author of the Quran didn't have a clue what this meant, right? E even Muhammad did not know what this meant. And I'll, I'll prove that to you next time, though. But so now you've got this problem. You don't know what these unintelligible letters mean. Now you've got the same supposed source of this book calling himself the one and then calling himself the we. We don't know what it, what it means to call him the one or the we. How's he the one if he's the we? How's he the we if he's the one? Now, if you want to say that the Quran is Trinitarian, then that would be an intelligible response. But no Muslim wants to do that, right? <laughs> the true God is Trinitarian triune. That's why the Bible has plural terms for God. The Bible disambiguates this in its full disclosure of the divine nature and, and the fact that God exists in three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. And my final conclusion, by the way, on where Muhammad picked this up is he didn't understand it when he heard it, but he overheard Jews in their recitation of the Bible uh, presenting God as speaking this way, like Genesis 1:26, let us make man in our image or 322, behold, the man has now become like one of us, or 11.7, come, let us go down and there confound their language, right? The Bible contains this sort of thing. Muhammad picked this up, the ear that he was, and he included it in his Quran and didn't understand what it meant because the Jews that he heard it from didn't understand what it meant, right? They wouldn't have understood any more than he did. And so uh, he, he employs this and doesn't have a clue what sense it makes. By the way, think about this. If if Allah is absolutely one and there is no plurality right in his being or what have you, then why would a term in the plural be the way that you would express majesty? W wouldn't it wouldn't it be the case that words that bespeak oneness communicate majesty? Because again, if God, the, the idea of a plural of majesty is that a plurality of something kind of shows a fullness, right? So uh, you might see, like sometimes royalty tries to come in with lots of pomp. They like to have all kinds of stuff with them to sort of make themselves appear greater and larger, right? So like a peacock spreading out its feathers and showing all of its beautiful feathers, 
this this plurality is supposed to show its beauty, its majesty, its greatness. Well, if Allah is absolutely one, then you would think that majesty is best expressed by means of oneness. But the very fact that there is this kind of expression, a plural of majesty, even though I don't think that's what's happening here in the Quran, I think it, it, it refutes Islam. It, it, it goes against the logic of the claim that Allah is absolutely one, and therefore majesty should be best explained in terms of unity. But it isn't because I think people intuitively recognize that in order for something to really stand out as rich and full and majestic, there has to be some kind of plurality, such as we have, by the way, in the doctrine of the Trinity. Not a plurality of gods, but a plurality of persons who all share the one divine nature. Anyways, so here the Quran is not clear on another matter. Thus do we make distinct the communication. So it's, it's found in many of these statements about the Quran being a clear book. All right. Um, there's another example of we statements. Here, here's the, what I was talking about with Iltifat. Notice this. We made the signs of the night dark, and we made the sign of the day bright. So notice it's we talking, so that you may look for your Lord's bounty. You see how it switches from the plural in the first person to the singular in the, uh, in the third person? That's very confusing, and it's doing it in the same verse. It's not just from one verse to another. It's in the same verse. All right, so you have this sort of problem in many passages of the Quran. All right, let me go back to this one, in fact, because I don't have it on the slides reflected here, but this story in the Quran, notice how it says, O Lord, remind mankind about the incident when your Lord brought into existence the offspring from the loins of Adam and his descendants. Now, I'll bet dollars to donuts that people who are hearing that for the first time, who, who haven't heard the tafsir of this verse, who haven't heard the commentaries or the explanations of Muslims, have no idea what I'm about to say. Now, if you've heard all this, then you know it. But my point here is, apart from these additional sources explaining this to you, it would be unclear. Quran is clear that Allah is one. Well, it's not clear when it says the we. <laughs> um, all right. So, no, it's not clear, right? It's not clear because supposedly the Quran's eternal. The Quran's the second in addition to Allah. So you have two eternal. So that's not clear to me. It's not clear that Allah is one when he turns around and speaks out of the other side of his mouth and says he's a we rather than a me, or an I, or a my. So that's not clear, right? The Quran is not clear that your deity is one. The only thing that's clear is that Allah claims that he speaks clearly and isn't even consistent enough to maintain that claim in the same breath as he's making the statement. All right, so here, notice this one. So I was saying that if you just read this, you, you might puzzle over exactly what's going on here. But you probably don't realize how, un, how this is understood by Muslims. According to the tafsirs and the hadiths and so forth, what's happening, according to this verse, is Allah created Adam, and then he took his right hand. Now, again, our Muslim friend, inshallah, here said that Allah is one, that's clear, but if he has a hand, then he has parts, and something that has parts is not absolutely one. So there's another reason to say that's not true. But Allah took his right hand, and he stroked Adam's back, and he brought out of Adam all of the descendants that were going to be born to him in the future. Okay, that's how the Hadiths and the Tafsirs explain this. Allah stroked Adam's back. He gave him the first back rub in history. He stroked Adam's back. He brought out of him all of his descendants. Now, some of you are putting two and two together here. You realize if Allah is, the idea is that there's, the semen is still in the loins of Adam. And so Allah is bringing people out so that they can testify to him as the true God, so that when he puts them back into Adam and then they're eventually born, they can't say in the future, we didn't know that you're the only God. This is why Islam thinks everybody's born on fitrah, because of this weird story of Allah taking everybody out and causing us to stand before him. Well, you're putting two and two together because you realize that according to the, the Quran and its bad science, semen proceeds from between the backbone and the ribs. 
That's why Allah is stroking Adam's back. Because Allah has very bad understanding of anatomy and all the rest. Right? So, so here, here's my point. Would you have gotten that from the verse if I hadn't told you that or you hadn't read that in Islamic commentaries or heard it from a Muslim? I but, suspect nobody would have, you know, come up with that. Yeah, but if we say no, then we are saying the book is not very clear. Yeah, that's my point, right? So again, it's not clear, right? So we don't know what these letters mean. We don't know why Allah speaks as one then speaks as many. We don't know why he goes back and forth speaking in the singular and plural in the same verse or speaking in the first person and third person, same verse. Uh, we don't know what this verse means according to the Hadith because we wouldn't have come to that understanding apart from the Hadith. Uh, we don't know a whole host of other things. In fact, um, I don't remember if I have it here. Um, oh, here's another thing real quick. Let me point this out. It says here, on the day when we will raise up in every people a witness against them from among themselves and bring you as a witness against these, and we have revealed the book to you explaining clearly everything. So here you have a we addressing a you. Who is the you that's being addressed? This you is going to be brought as a witness against people. So who is this? Well, if you ask Muslims, it's Muhammad. But where does the verse say that? Where does the verse say that Muhammad is the one that Allah is going to bring as a witness against people? The name or the word Muhammad is only used four times in the Quran, and it's not even clear in most of those occasions that it's being used as a proper name rather than as a title. And, and in any case, it's not clear that it's the same person who's the author of all these surahs. So who is this you? He says, uh, right hand indicates authority. It's not literal. Just as Quran says, what your right hand possesses, talking about slaves under authority. Okay, so uh, notice this. He's, he's trying to prove that because the Quran can use the term hand figuratively, therefore when it uses the term hand for Allah, it's being used figuratively. But this is fallacious. Because notice that the figure of speech that he gives here is being used in reference to human beings. Right? It, it says, those whom your right hands possess. It doesn't literally mean the right hand of a human being. I grant that. It can be used as a figure of speech. But does that mean that human beings don't have literal right hands? Just because the term hand can be used figuratively for human beings? Well, so, mutatis mutandis, by the same token, if it can be used figuratively for human beings and literally for human beings, you're not disproving that it can be used figuratively for Allah and literally for Allah. Now, let me prove to you that the Quran does, in some cases, use the term hand or hands literally for Allah. In Surah 3875 of the Quran, it says that Satan was upbraided by Allah because he refused to prostrate to Adam. The reason why Satan was obligated to prostrate to Adam, what made Adam special and a worthy object of prostration, Allah said, is because he created him with his own two hands. Now, if we plug in your interpretation that hand or hands just means authority. And so Satan was supposed to bow down to Adam because Adam was made with Allah's authority or power. Well, then why is why is that the case? Right. Why was Adam special and worthy of prostration or being prostrated to as opposed to everything else? Everything was created by Allah's authority. Right. I was created by uh, God's power. Not Allah. Allah doesn't exist. But I was created by God's power. So if hands in the Quran is just a way of saying his power or his authority, then there's nothing special about Adam, and there's no reason for Allah to say, you were obligated to bow down to Satan because I created him with my own two hands. What makes this even worse is when you look at the Hadith of intercession, which is a mutawatir Hadith, a Hadith that is mass narrated, so it comes through multiple chains of narrators, it can't be contested, According to the Hadith of Intercession, on the Day of Resurrection, the people that are standing on that plain, all naked, by the way, men and women, Allah is very immodest. He wants men and women to stand there naked for a long period of time. People are going to grow anxious and want Allah to speed the Day of Judgment along so that they can get through with it. The sun's beating down on them. It's, it's not a pleasant experience. And so the people began to say to themselves, we need to seek out somebody who's worthy enough to intercede for us with Allah. We're told that they're going to go to Adam. Adam is going to say, I'm not worthy. Go to Noah. Noah is going to say, I'm not worthy. Go to Abraham. Abraham is going to say, I'm not worthy. Go to Moses. 
Moses is going to say, I'm not worthy. Go to David. David's going to say, I'm not worthy. Go to Jesus. Jesus is not going to say, I'm not worthy, but he is said in the Hadith, going to say, go to Muhammad. Now, what's going on in the Hadith is they're going to these people because there's something special about each one of these individuals as prophets that make them think they're worthy of interceding with Allah. The reason they go to Abraham, for example, according to the Hadith, is because Abraham was called the friend of God. The reason they go to Moses is because he's the one that Allah spoke to directly. The reason they go to David is because he's the one that Allah, uh, he was a man after Allah's own heart and so forth. The reason they go to Jesus is because he was Allah's word. The reason they're supposed to go to Muhammad is because he's the seal of the prophet. So what is it that's special about Adam? Why do they first want to go to Adam as the one who can intercede for them? Because according to the Hadith, he was made with Allah's own two hands. There are other hadiths that talk about Allah putting his hand between Muhammad's shoulder blades and Muhammad feeling its coolness in his chest. We're told that Allah is going to shake hands with Umar on the day of resurrection. Uh, we're told uh, numerous things about Allah's hands. He rubbed Adam's back with it. It's not a figurative hand, even if the term hand can in some cases be used for him. But now notice this. Let's pretend that what I just got through saying can be challenged. I don't think it really can. I think Muhammad was a pagan who thought like other pagans that his deity was an embodied being, a finite being, and so forth. But let's pretend that all that I just said is not true. What have I just done, though? I've shown that the Quran is ambiguous because, according to this guy, it means authority. But I've given, I think, a pretty good case for taking it literally. So here we have, inshallah, providing us yet another example, one I didn't even intend to give for the Quran being ambiguous and unclear. Or ambiguous and unclear mean the same thing. So um, Allah's cold hand, and then also you've got like hadiths are talking about how Allah's four fingers are busy, all that kind of thing. Um, so then the question comes when we see something is clear or not clear, whom do we need to trust? So we look at the um, early Muslims who try to figure out all those phrases and words and then come up with ideas. In certain occasions, you've got like 12 different opinion about just three letters. Or should we trust 21st century people who had the privilege of having the, this um, new scholarship, all those kind of things, new meaning of the words. So when the, something is clear or something is not clear or there is dispute, whom are we going to trust? Yeah, the problem is Muhammad. Well, I don't want to I don't want to tell people what I want to tell them next time, but uh, he ends up being not very helpful. He ends up not being very helpful. But the, as a Muslim, right, they would be obligated to accept whatever interpretation Muhammad gives. So he's supposed yeah. to be the best scholar, and their best scholar tells them that Allah touched his shoulders with his mm -hmm. cold hands. Yeah, his icy cold. cold. Yeah, he uh, he is not he's not giving people warm fuzzies to be sure. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, there's so many other hadiths on on the whole issue of Allah's anatomy, even just his hands. Like there's a there's a hadith where it talks about Moses blaming Adam for getting them kicked out of the garden, even though he was made with Allah's two hands. Yeah. And then Adam says, weren't you that Moses that Allah wrote the Torah for with his own hands? And the idea is, as the hadith explains, the Torah was supposedly written by Allah with his own hand 40 years before the, Adam was made. And so Adam's fate was written in the Torah before it ever happened. And so Moses can't legitimately blame Adam is what Adam's saying. So apparently Allah, Islam is not a version of compatibilism, right? In, in Christianity, there are Christians who hold to the idea that God's sovereignty and man's responsibility are compatible. Well, Islamic theology is not compatibilistic, so they wouldn't fall into like the reformed camp or anything like that. You you hear some very ignorant, ill-informed people trying to conflate those two things. Anyways, Allah is not a compatibilist, and so Muhammad or Adam says that uh, 
that Moses shouldn't have blamed him because he had the Torah that was written with his with Allah's hand. Allah wrote the Torah for Moses with his hand. There's there's various statements in certain Islamic sources where it says things like uh, Allah was kicking back against a rock while he wrote the Ten Commandments for Moses, and you could hear the screech of the quill, right? So as he's writing with this implement, you could hear it. You know, Allah's over there. But it's like the Flintstones, right? I don't know if you ever saw the Flintstones, uh, but you know, how, you know, they're chiseling out words. There's Allah over there busily working away, and uh, Moses, I guess, could hear it while Allah was being propped up by a rock. Uh, there's statements where it says that Allah created only four things with his own hand, the pen, apparently that pen he was using to write with for the, the Ten Commandments. Uh, he created Adam with his own hands. He planted the trees of the Garden of Eden with his hands. And uh, he wrote the Torah with his own hands. So you can't just make this figurative, right? The, Adam was supposedly special because Allah made him with his own two hands. And, but in any case, I mean, that kind of you know goes off a little bit further than what we were focused on, which is the question of the Quran's clarity. There have been many Muslims in history who have believed just what I said and plenty who have disagreed. And they're, they're not just fringe individuals, wild-eyed individuals. These are people that are committed to these, these sources. And so what gives? If they're so miraculously clear, exhaustively detailed, Allah expounds everything, the verses are clear, the book is clear, you know, why is it that Allah seems to have spoken in a way that uh, produced so much confusion, especially when he was claiming in this book to be getting past the problem that was true for Christians and Jews? We are the ones supposedly subject to conjecture. Uh, by the way, I'm not sure if I have something more on here. Um, oh, no, I don't. So what I was... Uh, let me take that off here. All right. Um, what I uh, what? So what what I heard from you is, you brought. I think there was over forty verses, expresses how Quran is clear book. Even the verses are clear, and through Quran you will see everything is clear. Even like look at that theology how they stole from Christianity. So you will see everything is clear, but. We just looked at three letters, 12 different opinions about these letters. And then at the end, it is clear to us that Allah knows best. Oh, so the meaning of those things only known to Allah. That's the only clear thing. Yeah. Why is Allah revealing things that only he knows, right? It's like a, it's like a game. Why, why are you telling people things that none, none of them are going to be able to understand? Now, by the way, when the Muslims say that, up to these points, right, what I read in these verses, Surah 11, Surah 12, all the verses that I read or put on the screen, up to those points, all Muhammad is claiming is that, is that the Quran is clear. That's, that's the claim, right? And my point is, when these Muslims then turn around and say only Allah knows their meaning, they're not acting in accordance with those verses, Right. There might be something else they're bringing in here when they talk that way, but it's not they're not deriving it from these verses or anything Muhammad had said up to those points. Right. Everything Muhammad was saying throughout the Quran is it's a clear book. And so you would think here's what I would think. If if I believe this book was really from God and this verse tells me that it's clear and I read these letters and I don't understand them, I would think there's something wrong with me. Because Allah says they're clear, right? So if I don't understand them, then there's something wrong with me. And if there's not something wrong with me, then Allah's a liar or Allah's ignorant. He spoke falsely. He doesn't understand what it means to call something clear or he doesn't understand that we don't understand what he's saying. I mean, there's something wrong here, right? But if you're a believer, if you're a Muslim, and you submit to these things, then you have to conclude that the problem's with you. You don't conclude only Allah knows their meaning because Allah told you that these are clear verses, right? But isn't Allah going to say, well, you don't understand because your heart is not clean? Yeah, well, that, yeah, that's part of what he would say because that's just how he is. And, you know, uh, that that's a possibility. You know, there's an option. Right. In terms of I think people sometimes misunderstand things because they have bad motives, but it's not it's not all that Allah claims. He he'll actually he actually 
well, he claims the verses are clear and everybody understands them and that sort of thing. They're clear and they're clarifying. They're, they're light in themselves and they illuminate, right? So uh, he can't just blame it on me. And the other problem is what we're really going to look at next time where Allah doesn't just say that it's unclear to certain people that have bad hearts. It's unclear to people because he's the only one that gets it. Right. He, he, he gave people a book that in the end wasn't really ever uh, intended to be known in, in the, for the most part by anyone but him. So it's almost like Allah was entertaining himself or something. I don't know. Even though when you were showing um, Yasser Qadir's book on like as he is expressing these 12 different meaning, mm -hmm. most most of um, individuals in that list are early Muslims. So it was like so clear it was just so clear early muslims were like fighting about certain verses to make sense of it that's just yeah. my to me like they, they they seem to assume that it has an intelligible meaning right they, so they they seem to be working under the assumption that it it should be clear because it's part of allah's book so yeah it I, what's the point of that and then muslims are supposed to memorize this right and why are you expending this effort to? Uh, I, I forget what all the combinations are, but there, you know, there's a number of different letters and letter combinations that are used at the beginning of certain surahs. So you have Alif Lam Ra, you have Tasin, you have Tasin Mim, right? There's all these different combinations, you know, and and you're supposed to memorize this for what? It doesn't mean anything. Why is it part of Allah's eternal book? Why? why has there been this waste of paper and ink uh it, it's so clear you need a scholar to understand yeah um no actually not only you need a scholar to understand you need to take their classes yeah and yeah oh yeah yeah we, we can we could uh no problem Aki. no problem he goes I, I i don't have a problem talking with advanced students about these things you and i can talk behind the scenes the old Yasser Qadi missed it by that much trick. Um, yeah, you know, this this is another thing. That because the Quran claims to be clear, the way that it does, as strenuously as it does, then it should be the case that you don't need a scholar. But all Muslims will insist that you need a scholar. And since they insist you need a scholar, they're giving the lie to Allah's claim in the Quran that it's uh, indeed the worst of living creatures in the sight of Allah are the deaf and dumb who do not use reason. <laughs> <laughs> like like you just a moment ago giving us a fallacious inference from the fact that because a verse can use a word figuratively therefore anytime it's used for Allah it must be figurative that's fallacious it's an erroneous conclusion so since you're saying the worst of living creatures in the sight of Allah are the deaf dumb and those who don't use reason and since I just showed that you didn't use reason then you must be deaf dumb and the worst of living creatures in the sight of your own deity and it's the same Allah kind of uh, have problem when people ask questions who wants to use their reasoning. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a video of a Muslim missionary who was saying like, why are you using your uncle, use your knuckle? Um, like you don't, your um, reasoning, you just need to believe what it's been said to you. Oh yeah, yeah. I have a, I have a video where I have a bunch of those quotes. I did it a long time ago for David. Um, what was it called? Uh, um, Muhammad? No, uh, maybe Muhammad's Believe It or No. That's that's the name of Maury's little cartoon book. Uh, it, anyways, it's uh, it was a video where I have these guys running around saying, uh, "You don't need your brain." Oh, yeah. To, <laughs> yeah. You don't. You don't use your brain to reject what Muhammad says. If if you do, you know. You're not supposed to use your brain for that. You can use your brain to receive what he says, but you can't use it to reject what he says. Otherwise, you should throw your brain away. Uh, yeah, private I, classes. I thought I had it here, but no, I don't have it. Yeah, I have, I have statements to that effect from Abu Musab, um, Abu Usama, number of Muslims will say that you just kind of have to park your brain when you're listening to Allah. Uh, did you see the, did you see the clip on, uh, 
his um, Muslim, um, ah, I, I forget his name, the Muslim guy. Um, well, Aladdin is here. Um, lots of people use those. Oh, he calls his old friend. We, we've had a few conversations and then he disappeared. France never give up on France. That's basic. <laughs> so I cut you off. What were you going to say? Uh, I, I'm ju just trying to remember the name of this guy. Um, he's the guy who was making fun of um, how God has body parts. Allah has body parts. Oh, yeah. Mufti Abu Layth. Yeah. Um, did you see his clip? He's talking about like, if you uh, we accept Islam because we're born into Muslim family. Otherwise, like no one would accept Islam. <laughs> Actually, let me, let me see if I can play this. I, I haven't seen that one, but I there's another one where he said uh, he said he thinks that Salafis are going to stop believing their thing. He says because he says I think they're starting to hear the words that are coming out of their mouth, and they're saying, <laughs> "Did I just say that? Gosh, that was stupid." <laughs> let me see if this can be heard. Let me play. Honest, well, why? Let's be honest for a minute. We would not accept Islam if we were, were not born. Let's be honest. Like, if I wasn't born Muslim, if I wasn't born in a Muslim family, that's what I mean by being Islam. It's kind of hard to hear it. Ah, sorry. But he. Uh, he's saying, uh, like, um, let's be honest. If we, if we are not born into a Muslim family, we would never accept this stuff. <laughs> yeah. So he, um, you know, he's like Shabir Ali. I know David just did a video on uh, the issue of fables in the Quran because he had, I, I, I didn't watch it yet, but he had contacted me the other night because he was wondering if I had any handy clips from Mufti Abu Layth. And he, uh, Mufti Abu Layth actually nuances it, I think, a little better than some in order to avoid too much uh, response from ill-tempered Muslims. So somebody like Shabir Ali will sometimes be less than cautious and not just say he disagrees with the interpretation of some Muslims when it comes to things in the Quran. And he'll make the mistake of saying this was an old fable, right? So David was trying to get a quote from Mufti like that. But as I recall, he's Mufti Abu Layth is a very smart guy. So he'll say that all sorts of things in the Quran, they, they, the, the interpretation of most Muslims is superstitious in his mind. So if you recognize that those are actually the true interpretations, then you, you basically have Mufti Abu Layth admitting that his book is full of legends and superstitions, but he, he, he would insist that that's just a misinterpretation, but he doesn't an, interpret Things like the jinn, he doesn't think that they're really a group of invisible beings or whatever uh, out there. He doesn't believe that Moses' staff turned into a snake. It merely looked like it, it had been a snake. He doesn't think that Jesus was born of a virgin, according to the Quran. You could go down the list. He, he reinterprets all sorts of things, juj and majuj. Uh, that's an embarrassing issue in the Quran, right? That's been a point of embarrassment in recent Islamic apologetics because Muslims are recognizing at this point in the, in, in history, you can't still claim that there's this wall somewhere that's holding back an incredible number of people and we don't know about it. Right. So that's created a problem, but yeah, yes, anyway, so yeah, yeah. So, Mufti, yeah, Mufti Abu Layth will make a lot of great admissions, but sometimes he's real careful in how he says it. It'd be nice if he just comes out and says the Quran's full of fables, but we'll use what we get, right? Your interpretation is a fable. I know. Yes, but that interpretation is what Allah meant. So, um, Quran's supposed to be clear. It is not. Early Muslims kind of try to figure that out. And then at the end, 21st century Muslim scholars come to conclusion that only clear thing is about clear Quran is that n meaning of those unclear things are known to Allah. 
did I understand that correctly? Yeah, basically. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know what else. I don't know what else to say. I mean, I'm I'm wondering if Inshallah here has something to say, because. I mean, this is his. This is his book. Wait, DCCI Ministries. Anthony, old friend, what do you think of the presentation of Rashid and Spencer in the debate? Please be honest. So here's my honest response. I only watched personally the first 10 minutes of it. Then David had me come on his show to respond to a couple of clips from it. So I can't give you a honest response based on the, the show or whatever because I only saw... 10 minutes and then I don't know if David played more than a couple of minutes of a cl of clips. So obviously that's not much to go on. I know that uh, Jake, the Muslim metaphysician is claiming that they did a bang up job or something. I suspect it's not as good as he thinks because Muslims often, often exaggerate. You would know that Allah Dean, you might know a Muslim or two. Um, no, uh, but uh, yeah, I, I, I probably, I will say this. I probably, I already know when I see who who's debating certain things that I'm probably not going to always agree with the Christians uh, on how they might answer certain things. So, uh, I mean, I have a different way of approaching certain topics. So, or what it, whatever it's worth. Approximate. Uh, 10 years ago, when I would tell Muslims, um, how can you follow Muhammad while your prophet had sex with six years old um, or married with child? They would like call me liar, liar, liar. Now, the moment when I ask them, would you have sex with a child? They know. I am talking about their prophet. I don't even need to mention Muhammad at all because now in the, they learned, yeah, the, she's going to like what Muhammad did. For decades, like maybe even centuries, Christians are saying, um, especially um, Christians who are converted from uh, Islam to Christianity, my life is in danger. Those things are happening because I am apostate and people want to kill me. And you are labeled with like being hate, uh, hate preacher. You are labeled being liar, all those kind of things. It is amazing that now, 21st century, people go to the live streams, which is being watched by millions, millions. And Muslims in those live streams simply turn to you and then say, yeah, under the Islamic law, we will kill you. Yeah, under the Islamic law, we will kill you. And then you get to see how Muslims are like cheering for that. That's so concerning to me. Just like really concerning. And they don't see like that's dangerous. They they think that's like something they need to cheer for. And in that discussion, Muslims turn to Robert Spencer and then express because he's a critic of Islam. Yeah, he will be punished. And then the same thing to uh, Brother Rashid. Uh, he's apostate, therefore he will be killed. And then you get to see like how like, just like Islam is just so ugly in every level. Um, I don't know if you were in the conversation when we were in Dearborn. Um, there was a conversation happened. One of the Christian brothers was expressing how they don't have lots of freedoms to do things in Dearborn while Muslims have those freedoms. He, he was expressing how in even Muslim countries Christians don't have those freedoms. Muslims have their own freedoms. They don't have certain kind of things. And then they come here. They even take your freedom for you to do certain things. It's ex It was the, exactly the same thing like you hear. Christian, it's okay for Christian, ex-Muslim Christian to be killed and not even able to travel his home country versus a someone who who become a muslim uh and spending all of his time to attack christian faith and making money from it is talking about how much freedom he has as an ex-christian muslim who wants to travel to muslim countries yet doesn't even don't even want to live there 
just like I think in that sense, that discussion was important to open our eyes and then see once again how dangerous Islam is. And and right now, Muslims are not even majority, yet they are able to rule and then they're able to warn us what is to come. So as a Christian, we need to be watchful of that, I think. Hmm. So I find that like very disturbing to just sit down and then hear a stream which has been watched over 10,000 people in that time was watching. And then here a Muslim turns to your brother and then says, oh, we will kill you because you critic Islam. We will kill you because you are apostate. Just disturbing, I think. Yeah, I'm... Uh... I'm also looking at the chat because uh, I, I see that some of the conversation obviously was about the Bible and things that it says about war, killing, violence, that sort of thing. Uh, and I can imagine probably how certain people responded to it. Uh, I don't think I don't think that some Christians today have a robust way of understanding the old testament how it relates to the new and the proper way of responding to that sort of thing so i, I can just imagine some of what happened but uh I, I highly doubt the islamic interpretation being given by jake is is how it it, it took place but yeah, I'm talking about how um allah is simple god is simple all that and he was like even uh, misusing the church fathers it's something right. like I find very strange people forget that Bible has the authority over everything and then they go to the individuals to make their point while knowing that point disagrees with the Bible. Um, those things mm -hmm. are bad, but um, yeah, overall, um, yeah, it is stressing to hear that your yeah. life of your brothers are in danger <laughs> because what they say and what they believe. Yeah, you know what's uh, it's kind of interesting. I just thought about it with Jake. Is so, I think when I first started becoming aware of him, he was m not so much a Salafi at that point. I think I'm not saying it's true, but Quran only. He was Quran only Muslim. See, yeah. and then uh, no, is is that that guy? He he was the thing is that from here's why here's why I'm bringing this up is that. I don't think that he would have held to an Athari creed, the the Salafi anthropomorphism. They, of course, deny that it's anthropomorphism, but it is. But he he wouldn't have held that because he was more philosophically inclined. And and Muslims who are philosophically inclined tend to be more muatizali in their thinking. So they will not only negate that Allah has hands, face, eyes, that sort of thing, but also any attributes because that impinges, that, that compromises his unity. And so it's just the fact that a lot of the prominent Muslim philosophers were more inclined in, in that direction away from Salafism. And However, when I hear him now, he's very much towing the Salafi line. Even to Mia, it seems to be all the rage for him. Well, the reason I find this interesting is because it's not Salafi Islam that likes philosophy. They hate philosophy, right? It's it's the more Matizali types that like philosophy or those who are Asheris, not Atharis, right? They tend to be favorable to philosophy because the Salafis are going to say that it's the Quran and the Sunnah that dictate what you're supposed to believe as a Muslim. You cannot affirm what Allah or his messenger did not affirm nor can you deny what Allah and his messenger have affirmed. So I, the, re the reason I find this interesting is because he still is holding on to this philosophical label. And when he attacks the Trinity, he's approaching it from that vantage point. He always wants to ignore the Bible in the discussion and a discussion even of the Quran in the Bible because he just thinks that this is an autonomous thing. that You can just reason your way through this. It's irrelevant what God has revealed and that sort of thing. And so that's why, I mean, it would account for why he would be more in, interested in running off to what this person or that person said in history, trying to hold you to, you know, account for everything that every person has ever said. 
And then, of course, you're not just trying to you're you're not just being made to account for what every person said, but uh, I forgot where I was going with that. But uh, yeah, I mean, the problem is that that sort of thing is unwieldy, right? How can it's one thing to have a Bible that's the revelation of God and be able to respond to somebody with what it says, and then be able to anticipate something from the, the millions of pages that have been written by Christians over the centuries, right? I can't possibly be responsible for knowing off the cuff uh, what this person or that person meant in context, right? Yeah. Anyway, um, I think we'll stop here. We've been live for one hour, 42, 43 minutes now. <laughs> Uh, thank you, thank you very much, Anthony, for um, joining us and helping us to think, uh, understand how clear book Quran is. Um, so meanings are only known to Allah. That's like shows um, clearness of it, and then many different meaning and interpretation, even in the clear book. Um, have you got anything is coming that we can pray for you? Well, first, uh, just a reminder to people, this was just the setup. The reason we've called this the mother of all problems is what we'll find out next week. But you need to know this background in order to have that momentum going into that discussion. Uh, so other than that, I'm teaching later today on Psalm 22 on my channel. So in about an hour and 45 minutes. And... That's uh, about it, other than I know I'm supposed to come back on with you in, Couple. When, did, when did we say? I'll send you the date. Okay. I mean, I have it in my phone. I just, I just don't know offhand. Um, in October. Oh, okay. Why do I have in my phone? Oh, oh, okay. Sura 112. So I... I put in my phone Sura 112. I'm looking at my date and I'm like, what does that mean? Why would I have Sura 112 in my phone? So uh, you and I are going to discuss Sura 112. Yeah, but I guess I need to get another date from you later to have the part two of Mother of oh, Yeah. That I okay. didn't do that. Okay, I'm putting here with Hatun, so I remember because I'm going to see that and think that's a very strange note for a Christian to have in his calendar, Sura 112. Am I supposed to recite it today? <laughs> it's very offensive to Christians, that verse. Um, <laughs> Should be okay. offensive to Muslims. Uh, I guess we will see you in just under two hours in your channel as you um, teach on Psalm um, 22. And then I'll get a date from you regarding the part two of Mother of the Problems. But before I think you go, uh, since you mentioned this word, and the word which Jessica encouraged us to learn. I've got song with that word. I will be playing that song. So um, uh, as I, before I play, thank you very much, everyone who joined us in the stream. By God's grace, we will see you again. Give these idiots the smackdown that they deserve. Untrained, ignorant people who don't have a clue. Ultra crappy Dirian. Ultra crappy Dirian. Ultra crappy Dirian. Ultra crappy Dirian. Untrained, ignorant people who don't have a clue. Untrained, unqualified, ignorant, arrogant individuals. What the hell? I mean, what the hell? Untrained, unqualified, ignorant, arrogant individuals. They don't even read Arabic. What the hell? I mean, ultra crappy Dirian. 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 I don't respond to stupidity and foolishness. What the hell? I mean, ultra crappy Dirian, 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 ultra crappy Dirian. I don't respond to stupidity and foolishness. What the hell? I mean, I don't respond to stupidity and foolishness. Ultra crappy Dirian. rarely come across somebody who is more vulgar, vile, foul-mouthed, vicious, repugnant, depraved excuse of a preacher. What the hell? I mean, what the hell? Ultra-crepidirian. Ultra-crepidirian. 
Ultra Crepidurian, Ultra Crepidurian, Ultra Crepidurian, Ultra Crepidurian. Now I wonder truly, does he know he is lying or is he mentally insane? Ultra Crepidurian, Ultra Crepidurian. Untrained, ignorant people who don't have a clue. Ultra Crepidurian, Ultra Crepidurian, Ultra Crepidurian. Ultra Crepidurian, Ultra Crepidurian, Ultra Crepidurian. Does he know he is lying or is he mentally insane? What the hell? I mean, Ultra Crepidurian, Ultra Crepidurian, Ultra Crepidurian, Ultra Crepidurian, Ultra Crepidurian, Ultra Crepidurian. Sometimes, yes, ignorant is good. Now I wonder truly, does he know he is lying or is he mentally insane?